You are listening to the Contemplative Motherhood Podcast. My name is Chelsea. I'm a teacher, practitioner, spiritual director, and pilgrim. And I'm Erin, a creative, homeschool educator, counselor, and spiritual seeker. Listen in as we dive deeper into the contemplative lifestyle through hearing about each of our lives. You'll hear our triumphs, failures, practices, and mistakes as we journey together. You might even hear a kid or two in the background. So grab some coffee, tea, curl up, and take off your shoes. You are welcome here. Now let's get started. Well, hello, hello, friends. Welcome back to the Contemplative Motherhood Podcast. I feel like I say that all of the time. (laughs) I'm Erin Thomas, and I'm here with Chelsea, my lovely co-host and friend extraordinaire. Hi, friend. How are you? Like, what's going on in your life? Um, I don't have as many exciting things in my life as you do. (laughs) So if you would like to just quickly share with our lovely (laughs) friends that are listening, what is going up with you, Erin? Yeah. So if you're watching the YouTube version of this, you might, it's like, what is that background? It's actually my bed. Um, so I'm coming at you from my bed because I broke my ankle on our vacation. Um, so I'm excited to get back a normal looking ankle. So hopefully we will not be podcasting from the bed for very long. (laughs) Hopefully these women will just pick you right up, Erin. This is, this is really good material. And, you know, I always say this, I say that we're happy to be here. Um, but we really are. We're happy to be here with our listeners and we feel like this is just such a special place Um, And so much more because of the beauty of the connection that you guys have provided for us in this community. So thank you for listening in. Even if it's your first time, welcome. We always want to make sure that we are coming with you to a thankful spirit and thanking you all for your time. Mm -hmm. Um, Today, we're going to continue season two. Um, And it's our series, The Stories of the Amis. So if you haven't listened to any of the prior stories, here is your permission ticket to do so. Um, so you will find that most of our episodes up to this point and this episode, um, Chelsea's done an amazing job of giving us a bit of a historical timeline and also some insight into these spiritual mothers that have really influenced a lot of roles of women today in the past and in the future. They were the original influencers. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> How about that? Um, so, Chels, can you lead us off today? I feel like we have a lot of subject matter to cover, and I know this one is very special to you. So, mm-hmm. hit me with it. Let's hear it. Yes, yeah. And I have to say, Erin, for everybody that listens, um, if you hear our kiddos and our spouses um, today, <laughs> yes. It's because we are really recording in our natural habitat. So oh, amorous. I can hear my kids pounding this the uh, roof over my head right now. And I'm wondering, what is going on up there? And I know, Erin, you're in the same situation. Oh, it's, it's someone's right. always opening the door. Please forgive us. It's just yes. real life, right? Yes. Background noise. Again, <laughs> I just want to say this is so much our natural habitat. But and um, this is not why this is going to be a tough episode for me. (laughs) Let's clarify that. Yes. It is going to be a tough episode for me because I have almost too much to say. Mm -hmm. And in this episode, just to do the unveiling, we are going to talk about the Christian desert Amas. And I will explain a bit more what I mean by calling them desert Amas. But first, I have to say, I adore these women. And at the same time, can find myself frustrated with them. Hmm. And you know why? It's because I see so much of myself in them. The good and the bad. And I feel like this episode might reveal a lot of myself to all of you who are listening. So just to come out and say it, to be brutally honest, um, if you've been reading the after show blogs, you can kind of hear a little bit about my past too. Um, and I grew up in a way of thinking that women were less than. Mm-hmm. And now, not so much my family teaching me that, 
but really what I was getting from what my religion was teaching me. That women were only good when we're fulfilling these subservient roles. And it took me years to find my voice, to find myself in a spiritual setting where I felt good enough, you know, where I felt equal. And I had to also throw out the idea that God had a gender. And you'll hear a lot of the word deconstruction. And that was part of myself deconstructing uh, what religion and how I identified myself just to kind of reconstruct that. So part of that deconstruction was realizing, you know, I am so used to using male terms for God, but coming to the realization, you know, God doesn't have that gender. And you'll see that throughout these episodes, I don't refer to God as he, I always replace he with another word. And I'm not trying to discount the religious writings that do refer to God as he or father, and that's just fine for everybody. But my season right now for me is best suited to seeing the beloved as genderless. So as something beyond gender. And that is what helps me be closer to the divine. So, you know, when I read about these Christian desert amas, you know, sometimes I feel like I am thrust back into the land of less than, you know, some of their writings and how they, because they really write with a reference to the male more than the female. And so, you know, and they get kind of perceived by some male disciples can take me right back to that land I left long ago. But as a contemplative, I appreciate so much how amazing it is to name and notice things and to learn to let go. So as a contemplative, I don't like to think in the and or the black, white, the he, she, that dual thinking. And there's so much for the word more. So in this episode, I'm going to do my best to stick to what the desert almas teach. And that is more of the beloved. And we talked about this with Ama Rabia, the beloved, the more of life, the more of reality. And that is what we see is so much more. So I'm going to try to embrace that paradox for us. I'm so glad. There's just the paradox is very prominent. And I'm the reason I'm laughing is because that was such a profound statement that you were sharing with us. And right at this moment, friends, um, my light went out like completely. So <laughs> this really, um, the lights in my house. So but I really love that you're sharing this, um, and I don't mean to distract, but if you heard us giggling a little bit, that is why, um, <laughs> because I was in the dark for a bit, um, we just, right. but we are still here. Um, but I really want to thank you for your vulnerability there, friend, and because I know this is really a challenging part for a lot of us, um, and we're obviously um, sharing from, and we've shared this, um, from a Christian faith tradition, but, you know, I think this is true for a lot of us across the board. And this is really important. So many of us have experience with, um, these societal religious constructs, you know, and social constructs really that have not always been supportive in nature for our lives. Um, specifically if we are female and, even perhaps condemning um, at times some of these beautifully inherent characteristics of our individuality, and that carries a lot of weight with it. So I just want to, you know, share with our listeners and with you, friend, that I think this is just a really good conversation to have. Um, another thing that's beautiful about having this conversation is that I really don't think that there's many of us who can't identify, right, with having the divine meet us where we are in our seeking Mm -hmm. and allow us to move forward in this journey and what our past has to teach us. Um, 
So yeah, this is really, really good stuff. Um, And we're going to get into a little bit more about that dual thinking concept that you dropped right in there. Um, (laughs) But so you will find in this historical context, these women are significant in the Christian tradition. So friend, let's talk a little bit about who they were and sort of their role in history and culture. What can you share with us about them? (laughs) <laughs> yes. Yeah. So what's interesting is they have, and you'll, you know, as we talk more about them, have had such a huge influence with really Christianity in its infancy, mm-hmm. but not a lot of people know about them. Like, it's it's very ama- true. yeah, it's amazing how few people know about them. You know, in the Christian tradition, the Orthodox Church has done a remarkable job at really highlighting these women, Hmm. Um, you know, so they've done a great job highlighting them, but a lot of them, they've just kind of gotten lost to history. So let's bring them back to the surface. Yeah, absolutely. Let's hear it. So most of these women, I love this. They defied their societal roles. They decided that they're only going to live for the divine and not for others, not for whatever category they have been placed in based on their birth, based on their gender, their economic class. And their defiance is a unique perspective that often gets overlooked. And I'm especially intrigued about the Desert Amas because they lived in a significant time of the formation of Christian spirituality. So tradition mainly shows that it was the men that shaped Christianity, but it was the women that really influenced it. You know, they both had such a prominent role, both genders. And these are the stories that I desire to tell, are the women that influenced it. So first, what we need to do, though, is to get a glimpse of the time frame we are traveling back to. And the reason why this episode is back-to-back of Ama Rabia's is because of the similarity in time and culture. Now, Ama Rabia was 8th to 9th century, but we are going to pull us back even more, and we're going to travel about a few hundred years back. Okay. Well, we're going to get right into the travel machine. Here we go. Uh, Way back to the timeline of history, (laughs) to what we call the Christian Desert Amas. Um, And so when we say Christian Desert Amas, um, friend, what are we saying? Who are the Christian Desert Amas? Can you define that term for us a little bit? Yeah. So we're talking about two different types of women. And the reason why we group them is it's hard to pull and just highlight one woman of one woman of this time period. They really should be a group. And it's not because their writings are the same. Um, They can be very vastly different, but their importance really shaped this early period of Christianity. So that's kind of why I thought, let's go ahead and group them together. So I'm mainly talking about really two different types of women. So it was either women who left their homelands and they lived in the harsh deserts of Palestine, Syria, and Egypt between the third and the sixth centuries. So these women, um, there's also desert fathers too, desert Abbas, and they lived around the same area as um, the men and women. And then some were hermits, some created their own monasteries, but they're all in these deserts of just nothingness, living in caves, feeding off whatever the land provided. And then the other group of women we're talking about are women who left established roles or redefined their roles to become spiritual mothers to the early church fathers. So when we talk about third and sixth centuries, Um, You know, we're really talking about Christianity as maybe like 100, 200 years old, even by the third, six centuries. Um, You know, obviously it's not, you know, we don't have Twitter or anything like that. So uh, the way that Christianity is being shaped is really early in its infancy. Now, and what we understand about these women is they desired to live out the teachings of Jesus unencumbered by age gender, social status. And to understand some context here, at this point, Christianity is part of the Roman Empire, really recently part of the Roman Empire, and it's becoming ingrained in the culture. So it used to be before as part of the Roman Empire, you really couldn't practice Christianity um, out loud. And so it was more of kind of this underground religion. 
when the Roman Empire accepts Christianity, it now becomes an imperial religion. Interesting. And that's why they a lot of people pulled away from that because they didn't want Christianity to become an imperial religion. So some males and females thought Christianity as the dominant religion of the empire prohibited them from living out what were the teachings of Jesus. So, you know, we aren't talking about power or superior superiority here. And so some of these women were referred to as Amas, but that does not refer to any type of superiority or rank within a community. So they're be, being called Amas at this point. But really, it was just a um, gracious term. It wasn't necessarily because you were in charge of anybody. Right. Because they didn't want that type of hierarchy. Right. So for the desert Amas, the desert became a place to listen to only the divine, to grow an awareness of self, and to learn true love of the divine and neighbor and become transformed into the likeness of Christ. So this is really, uh, this is a beautiful concept. And a lot of us, I think, um, don't have this sort of historical background. Um, and so sharing some of that historical background and defining what the desert means is incredibly important. And I think also I just want to contribute a little bit in saying that I think that it's important for an, us to really understand where the Roman Empire was at the time because this can also assist us in putting the writings into context, right? Right. Um, so not just the concepts of how we talk about them, but also what what has been written um, from them or about them. And this really gives us a lot, a lot of understanding about society and culture at this time, mm -hmm. um, which is really influential. And I think you bring up a good point. Um, I think, you know, we are hesitant and we always um, often refer to this concept in sort of a structural positioning. Um, but this isn't prescriptive in nature. Like this wasn't a food chain per se, right? Um, and so the terms that we use uh, to share about them, um, I wonder what they would have called themselves, right? <laughs> like yeah. how, what it, would that have been? Look, What would that have been like? And um, so you see in prior episodes that some of these other Amas we've profiled, we look at their life's mission and their work and their writings. Um, and that's sort of what gives us this lens to um, find out more about them. Uh, will you share with us a little bit more on their their mission, their work, and their writings? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So from their writings, you know, they display – a desire to learn how to love the divine fully. And I mean, with every fiber of your being and to truly understand what it was that commandment to love their neighbor as themselves. You know, and Cynthia Bourget uh, has this book called The Wisdom of Jesus. And she really breaks this down. What does loving your neighbor meant? And it means to love someone as an extension of yourself hmm. and not loving someone as another being, but they are the very essence of you, the very essence of us. I mean, those are some very powerful words. I think that really transforms this concept as we dig deeper. We've talked about this a little bit in pretty much every other Alma story yeah. that yes. we've shared, mm -hmm. you know, like that these are spiritual mothers are representations and profiles of how we can see what being a contemplative within whatever concept fleshed out for those who went before us. And that's where we find our connection. Um, so share with us a little bit, friend. Like, why do you think this is relevant for us? I would say, you know, based on the work of other r women writers – who have put together many books on these different women highlight common themes. And I think that's what's relevant. So one book that we're going to talk about is uh, by Mary Foreman. And she wrote Praying with the Desert Mothers. And this will be linked in, in our show notes and after show blog. So she breaks up the Christian Desert Amas 
into some categories. So spiritual midwives, scripture scholars, and she talks about the spiritual practices of the Almas. And, you know, she has more, but those are the three that we're really going to talk about here in these episodes. So just to put this in context, so scholars have uncovered sayings from 151 desert fathers and mothers. Hmm. So out of the 151, there's only four women. So Syncletica, Sarah, and Theodora, they have multiple saints, still not very much, but, you know, a, some. And then there's Ama Matrona, who's mentioned, but you don't really see any of her writings. But we know there are so many more women that lived and taught. And it's really in that spirit we will remember all those women who lived a life of more and encompass their spirit as we do these episodes and listen to them. Yeah. So this, I mean, this is a really great way to break this down for us tangibly. Um, You know, we talk about, you know, understanding the historic element to sharing these stories and two, because we we can also glean that as far as written material on the desert Christian Amas, like we don't have a ton to reference, yeah. right? Like, and yeah. so this segues a lot to the fact that it's important to know that representation also gives us insight. And this insight into the fact that these are writings um, we have reference and these are documents available for us historically. But clearly we know <laughs> that they're were more or may have been more. And that's important not to let us slip by. And we're going to talk a little bit about that more in part two. But so it's with that understanding that we move into this little fun formula that Chelsea unknowingly (laughs) shared with us. Um, But, uh, you know, primarily from Mary Foreman's um, writings. And so these three categories, the spiritual midwives, the scripture scholars, and the spiritual practices, some of the more dominant themes. I'm assuming we should start at the beginning, right? Fran, what do you what do you think about that? Yes, always at the beginning. So let's do it. <laughs> okay. So let's dive into, we're going to dive into the women right now as spiritual midwives. Mm. And I love this imagery because when you hear the term midwife, you know, you think of one who's, you know, who assists bringing life into this world. You know, they're not responsible for creating the life per se, but responsible for the transition of life into these new world. So for these Amas, they were called bearers of the spirit. Hmm. And these spiritual midwives were, and I quote, capable of listening to the hearts of those around them in such a way that the spirit birthed Christ in their hearts and in their lives. And so they stood as midwives to that unfolding experience of an ever fuller dimension of Christ living in the hearts of the women and the men whom they served and to whom they listened. So they use this patience by listening to those around them. They use patience to themselves as they birth new connections with the divine. They knew gentleness to be a key role as others found union with the beloved. And most of all, humility. So as a way to truly understand to be human means finding humility daily. And this is the concept that seeks to elaborate on the fact that being human and understand that humanity does not equal perfection. And that was a big one for me to learn. Yeah, I'd like to say it again, right? (laughs) I might be a perfectionist. So perfection should never be a goal. And humility isn't hierarchical in nature. It's just simply the concept of loving others, of Mm -hmm. loving ourselves and loving God. That is true humility. And in so many words, this is a way to express it on others, on ourselves, and even on God. So our first saying from Ama Syncletica, she says, neither assists. Ass- ass- <laughs> <laughs> Let's have a redo. Oh, no. Sorry. Way. Okay. <laughs> Ama Syncletica. Yes. Says, neither asceticism nor vigils 
nor any kind of suffering are able to save. Only true humility can do that. I love that that's, first of all, mic drop, that's our first saying um, that we're going to share. Chelsea's done an amazing job of sharing sayings and and selecting them. They're just beautiful. But I want to point out too, one of the most important parts that you referenced is like this concept of true humility, right? Because I'll be frank with you, I'm also a perfectionist. <laughs> but I want to say that, you know, this this is sort of a taboo subject, right? Like this word gets thrown around a lot. And there are so many working <laughs> societal definitions and constructs that we have really built around this concept, right? Like we will find this in not just in religious settings, like in a lot of other settings. And so you know, we kind of mentioned this earlier in the episode, and to delve into the stories of these amas, it's also to place into context that even their roles and social constructs were influenced in a window of hierarchy. And this is just frankly a historical and cultural understanding. This is not like, this is just a fact, right? So, but to get to the heart of the message, right, of these amas, it helps us remove this hierarchy, even metaphorically. So we can understand their hearts and their mission and their connection with the divine on a deeper level within their humanity. And Charles, you have selected like so many great, wonderful historic quotes, um, but this is another one of them. And I'd love for you to share with us this next saying, because I I always say it's my favorite, but this <laughs> might be my favorite. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> So this story is from um, Melania the Elder. So she's not a desert ama, um, but she's a woman who was part of the group that influenced, you know, what are considered the church fathers. And she is that spiritual midwife. So some background here so we can get to know her a a bit better. Melania was friends with Evagoras Ponticus. Nailed it. I know. I'm going to, I have to say his name so much and he's going to trip me up. So Evagrius was a young man who was well-educated and he kind of had this way with words and he enjoyed his life with women. (laughs) Not want to give that up. He was very, you know, had this way of talking theology. And so everyone kind of naturally thought, oh, he'll be a priest and a bishop and kind of really rise up in the ranks. Uh, But he didn't want to be celibate. And Evagoras had gotten into trouble with, with a particular woman, and he was sent to live with Melania the Older. Melania the Elder, excuse me, who had established a monastery at this point in her life. And she immediately took to him, and she talks about how she really felt guided by a higher power to help him. Hmm. So I'm going to quote from Foreman's book to kind of give a bit of insight into the story and why it's important. And it helps us to understand how Melania formed the spiritual midwife relationship with Evagrius. And this transition to a life of spiritual devotion to the divine that he slowly developed. If you're interested, the reference is found on page 14. (laughs) She, this is Melania we're talking about. She undertook to be responsible with respect to Evagrius's salvation. And when I say salvation in those days, it just mean, they just defined it as spiritual health. Okay, like we have physical health. This is his spiritual health. She was going to be responsible for his spiritual health as well as his physical well-being. And her care for Evagoras represents this ancient practice of what was called kustos anami. I'm sure I pronounced that wrong. That is custody <laughs> of the heart and soul. So this implies... There were three different elements of this relationship. So the responsibility for another person's well-being and ultimate salvation. So at this time, spiritual health, a knowledge of his or her inner life, which could encompass a great deal of things. And finally, the relationship was a spiritual dimension which we don't really know all the details of what that meant. So if you are going to be a custodian of someone else's heart and soul, these were the three kind of requirements. So she was really a spiritual doctor, a spiritual midwife. Hmm. And so she would listen intently to Evagoras's vision 
you know, and, you know, kind of his inner chaos, his inner turmoil of trying to figure out what he wanted to do with his life. And she really kind of became the medicine he needed to become well. And the interesting thing is he was actually physically sick at this time as well. So she really was taking care of him spiritually and physically. She saw that they had to be linked together. So other accounts of her kind of reveal her profound knowledge of the scriptures. She had to have deep knowledge of, you know, her practice of Christianity and how this could help his spiritual health. And, you know, she used that to kind of draw the spiritual nourishment, you know, not only for herself, but for him as well. So I, this is You've done an amazing job on this, and I I know I say this a lot, but part of this is having not grown up um, in this level of historical background um, and kind of from a different background than you, Charles, like these desert Christian Amas are really interesting to me, and for more reasons than one, but this in particular, as you said, it's such a beautiful imagery that we're given here, and I feel like we see this a lot in the sharing of stories of these women, like these beautiful pictures, even in the small amount of writings that were given. And so you're highlighting this ancient tradition and you shared it. And Kustos Anami, you know, if if you know, <laughs> if we've pronounced that correctly, do a, do a Google. Um, but there seems to be really like a great emphasis on the character attributes of these mm. women, right? And that sort of surrounds this responsibility that she had. And we can make a lot of assumptions. And, you know, we can really interpret this many different ways. And sometimes we're going to be wrong, right? Like, (laughs) but often, you know, in these writings, we're left to infer and interpret some of the aspects of the character of these women. And it's Primarily because their character wasn't necessarily being assessed at the time, right? Like there wasn't a reporter. There was no one really writing all this down from a third-party perspective. And it simply didn't exist to the extent that we could really dig deeply. Um, But, you know, if we look at this in an overview perspective, we see that there's so much to be gleaned from this responsibility um, that Melania showed that really supports the midwifery concept. Um, attributes like the amount of compassionate listening that she clearly had to have in this situation, listening to the inner world of those who struggle with certain aspects of their life, her gentleness that it would take to be and shepherd this level of commitment. Um, So this nurturing spirit is just really beautiful. And I think we could carry on this conversation for days. (laughs) Like, Mm -hmm. quite honestly, one saying, right, from – this um, beautiful woman could go on for days, but we, like always, sort of want to pause and come back to the conversation where we address the Christian desert almas from a spiritual guide lens. And then finally, through the practices that they lived out deeply and beautifully. Um, so that's kind of the format that we've been given. And while we're doing that, um, Chels, can you give us a bit to chew on this week? Um, we've introduced this concept of spiritual midwifery. And in our story of the Christian desert, Amas, um, you know, we could go on and on and on. Um, mm-hmm. Is there a challenge with this beautiful imagery that we can lean into as a part of our bridge um, to next week's episode, next week's episode, excuse me, where we will continue this conversation because, uh, quite frankly, spiritual midwifery could be a four-day conversation. (laughs) So, friend, how do we apply this? Yeah, and I would say, so I'm going to give us a challenge. It's inspired from another book that we'll actually talk about in the next episode um, that, you know, gives us time to take the concept of a spiritual midwife, a bearer of the spirit, and really give that space for yourself. Mm -hmm. So becoming a midwife is not a born trait. It is a lived trait. This is someone who has lived through experience and struggle who allows sorrows and joy to deepen compassion. 
This is a person who has an ability to love honestly and wisely. So for this week, give yourself intentional time to those who are your spiritual midwives who bear your spirit and reflect on their qualities and then take the time to recognize and name these qualities in yourself. We all can be bearers of the spirit. And for some of you, you already are. So stay present with those qualities and let them inhibit and take over your soul. And so that is our challenge for the week. Not a very, obviously very profound challenge. Um, But we want to give you guys time to do this intentionally. And we know that as moms, we may not do this um, if we're not given direction. So with that beautiful challenge this week, we are going to wrap up part one of the Desert Christian Amas. And we hope that you guys will tune in for part two because there's a lot more from about this woman. There's a lot more to where this came from. So we hope that you join us again. Thank you again for joining us today on the Contemplative Motherhood Podcast with us, your hosts, Aaron Thomas and Chelsea Whipple. To get regular updates on our podcast, hear new episode drops, interact with us, and find our show notes, go to our website, www.contemplativemotherhood.org. There you can also sign up for our newsletter. As always, we appreciate your support of this podcast and in helping us share our journey with others. We invite you to regularly check our blog. Our after-show blog post will allow you to dive deeper on the content shared on an episode. So if you enjoyed today's podcast, make sure to subscribe, rate, and leave us a review. This helps us to cross paths with other Pilgrim Mamas across the board. Until next time.